All right, well, welcome everyone and thanks for joining this webinar all about secure backup in the cloud and how to unlock five keys to success. A couple of uh, welcome words from myself as we get started. My name's Sam Nichols, Director of Public Cloud here at Veeam Software. So I get the fun job of pretty much doing or looking after anything and everything that we do with the three major hyperscalers, AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. And I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Mr. Michael Cave, Field CTO of Cloud Native, also at Beam. Michael, a few welcome words from you. Yeah, hey everyone. Yeah, so my focus at, at Veeam is to speak to our customers, our prospects, the field, our alliance partners, get that feedback, and then that helps us build better products to enable us to be better out there in the field. And in particular, we have a strong focus around security, which is why me and Sam wanted to come and deliver this session and just raise some awareness around what it looks like in the cloud when it comes to it's very easy to jump into the cloud and it's very easy to build something create something and then you're stuck with that so what we want to really highlight is some of those day zero type type um trends as to let's not get caught up with them so that we are secure from day zero and onwards so that we're not going to have to fight with um threats and and cyber security later on so back to you sam yeah, absolutely. It's a good point, right? Um, but before we kind of dive into what the, the five keys to success, I guess, are, we're going to run through a little bit of data. One piece of data that I don't have in here is actually from a, a piece of research done by Fortinet recently that showed 95% of organizations have some degree of concern about their cloud security. And that's ultimately because if we jump to this next slide, looking at kind of what the biggest security threat is right now out there in the landscape is ransomware. It's, it's happening and it's rife, right? So 85% of organizations have suffered at least one ransomware attack in the last 12 months. Um, so the vast majority of organizations have, have had to face this. But more interestingly than that is it's not a one and done thing. You know, if you have a look here, we've got 17% of those organizations dealing with that four, five, six or more times. So ransomware isn't a one and done thing. It's going to be a constant threat to, to your environment that you're going to have to have to cater for. Right. And I think when we think about ransomware and preventing it, it is very much the, the first thing that our mind goes to is this preventative approach. Right. What can I do to stop the bad guys getting in? But what this piece of data is telling us is, you know, ultimately, these bad guys have an unlimited number of attempts on your environment and only have to be right once to get in and start wreaking havoc. Conversely, you guys have to be right 100% of the time in order to prevent those attacks. So that's a very difficult thing to do, right? We're all human beings, we're all fallible. So not only do we have to account for the preventative part of that, but we have to account for the remediative part of that, right? If there is a successful incident or attempt on our environment, how can we get back to a state of cleanliness as fast and quickly as possible? Michael, anything that you want to add around this? Yeah, I think like one thing is where we got this this data report from. So the data protection trends report is a is a report that we um, as Veeam are sponsoring but it's not to our existing customer base. It's completely um, like hidden from that fact. So there will be some Veeam customers in there, but it's a broad broad amount of people as well. I think the number, Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's around, th the end number is around 3,000 um, yeah. answers to this. And we then have a, another report, which um, maybe we touch on is around the ransomware report. So it goes into a lot more detail. And the fact is, is like us having to do ransomware reports and ransomware surveys and questionnaires kind of gives you the idea is that the, this is this is a thing and it's inevitable that we're that we're having to deal with this as well yeah absolutely and as we double click into this you know having a look at outages or disasters uh just how much cybersecurity has, has crept up of this right you know when we think of a disaster or a disaster recovery event like our minds always kind of go to, to the natural disasters or maybe a fire or a flood in the data center. But if you have a look here, you know, a cybersecurity event, and in this case, ransomware, is by far the leading cause of outage or disasters within our data centers, but also in the public cloud as well. So we absolutely have to have to cater for this and have a recovery plan in place to ensure that our businesses can get back up and running. And one of the 
things that you absolutely should be doing is having a clean backup. And that's really what we're going to uncover in this deck. So the next, uh, the next slide also just shows, you know, as for, for modern data protection for 2023, what would you consider to be a defining aspect of modern or innovative data protection solution for your organization? Backup absolutely has to be part of that cyber strategy, right? So we were talking about it earlier. Yep, our minds always go to the preventative piece. How do we stop the bad guys from getting into our um, environments and causing the chaos? But again, the backup piece from the remediative angle is absolutely critical. And we have to make sure that we have a integrated data protection approach with our data security strategy and again later on in the in the in the deck we're going to go through some best practices that you can be doing to help ensure the integrity and reliability of your backups on, on the public cloud but one thing for sure is that cyber and backup teams aren't currently aligned right there's a, a bit of a, a rift in between kind of again that preventative piece and then the remediative piece and bringing the backup teams in. And that's uh, that rift is is pretty much consistent across the entire organization, whether you're talking to the CISO, SecOps, backup admins, IT operations, you know, pretty much everyone is saying that some degree of, uh, of let's just call it an overhaul or an improvement is required to bring that alignment even closer and make backup and recovery an integral part of any cybersecurity strategy. And that really comes down to this next piece, right? So did they attack your backup repository? At least 93% of cyber attacks targeted the backup repositories. And this is a really quick evolution that we've seen over the, over the last few months and years is that as ransomware uh, actors or you know, bad actors have gained access to environments, they've realized that instead of paying the ransom, people are attempting to recover their environments from a backup. So not only are they attacking the production environment, whether that's a virtual machine, a database, a file share, whatever it is, but they're also going after the backups as well. So you don't have an option to recover and you're kind of left facing paying that ransom. Michael, anything that you want to add here? Yeah, I think... Uh, just to summarize a bit about what you've just like what we've just done unpack there in the first like five slides here and and how that cybersecurity landscape like we're not talking about a group of friends in a basement attacking like IP addresses on the on the network these are also these are companies right these are companies that are evolving rapidly that are basically exposing or attacking vulnerabilities within environments, whether that be backup repositories that are not secured correctly, whether it be um, just your environment that's not secured correctly and it's it's being exposed to the, 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 uh, the internet. I, I think there's a, there's a misconception just broadly around cybersecurity being um, a, a group of hobbyists, hacker, hackers type thing that are in basements that are attacking and it's not there's a, there's a revenue that's actually happening here these these corporations they have H, hr departments um as well and i think what we have to be aware of as as the fictitious blue team if you will to prevent this and stop people getting in um to sam's point is cyber criminals or cyber security is becoming more sophisticated in their tactics we've seen that over the last few years already so having that smart about being able to understand where it where is my backup repository how do i get to that so we're going to touch on some of those areas as we go through it but the the key trend that we're seeing and that the conversation between the siso and the the technology teams the systems administrators etc is around how do we what is the process of protecting that data from those unethical means like the hackers um from these latest advancements in, in cybersecurity. Um, we all know about the exponential growth of data and we have like such more access to data than we've ever had before. We need a way of being able to manage that data and protect that data in the most appropriate way possible.
Absolutely. And that kind of just leads us onto this like final data slide before we get into these five backup best practices is just ensuring backups, a good, clean, reliable, uh, integral backup is the most common element of any incident response playbook. Right. It's it's right at the top here. We've highlighted it in green for you. Backup copies and assured cleanliness. Right. It's not enough just to have a backup, but having a backup that you could actually rely on and have proven to be able to, to cleanly recover your environment from is, is critical to any strategy. And that applies for uh, backups of on premises workloads, whether you're targeting a backup repository on premises or doing a backup copy to the cloud. It also goes for your workloads that you have running on public cloud resources, right? So whether that's, again, like a, an EC2 instance in AWS or a database like RDS, um, maybe it's containerized workloads like ECS or EKS, same goes for Azure, same goes for Google. You've got to have that clean backup as part of your strategy. So if an an attack on your uh, environment is successful, you can then be successful in recovering that without having to pay the ransom. Because even organizations that ultimately have succumbed and have paid the ransom, I think only half of them end up actually getting their data back even once they've paid that. So this is the only thing that you can really do to kind of ensure that you can get your business back up and running. So Michael, anything that else that you want to add around this before we start getting into those best practices? Yeah, I don't. Look, so the key thing here is that backups aren't new, right? We've been talking about backups for many, many, many decades, right? Around how do we take a how do we take a copy of that backup and how do we store it somewhere safe so that if something bad was to happen, how do we recover that? Ransomware is just another form of a failure. Like whether we talk about fire, flood, blood, accidental deletion, all of that long list that Sam shared earlier is ransomware is just another failure point, a failure scenario that we have within our business. But now look at 2023 and where we have the ability to run our workloads, whether it be the public cloud, like that's what we're discussing here around the three big hyperscalers, but also SaaS based workloads when, when you're running like your Salesforce, if you're running Salesforce, Microsoft 365, are they susceptible to attacks as well? I would argue that Yes, they absolutely are. If you think about OneDrive, for example, OneDrive is just a file sharing protocol that Microsoft have. If I gain access to even just a laptop, I can encrypt that OneDrive data that then gets synced up into my Microsoft 365. And then where else do I go from there? It, 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 there's lots of different areas as well as on-premises from a physical machine point of view. We just have a breadth of platforms that now we have to deal with. But backups are not new. Like we've been talking about the insurance policy, the last line of defense for, for many years. And I think I think that's a, that's a good place for us to be. It's a head start for the, for the blue team to make sure that we protect that last line of defense so that we can get back up and running um, as fast as possible. The only thing I would add here as well is that it's not as simple a ransomware attack without going into the the weeds of of what a ransomware attack looks like um but it generally the a misconception that i have when i'm speaking to to our clients is attacker gets into our into our environment they cause some sort of um damage encryption some sort of um uh, exploitation of the data that they have and then they get out again they ask for the date they ask for money and then they're out and the, the misconception is that it's over within like days maybe a week but actually and, and i'm going to pull a number out from there's an ibm report that actually talks about the average of what that attack process looks like is that it, it takes around 49 days to identify a ransomware attack so because it's not just potentially one group that is that is making that attack possible you might also see that from an initial point of view you've got the research aspect people are throwing out um, social engineering attacks around phishing around infrastructure weaknesses and they're they're basically researching a a gap in a gap in the infrastructure a gap in the environment so that they can gain access then they stage that attack but at that point they may maybe looking for that access and if you go onto reddit right now you can go and find in some dark alleys of reddit you can find some access that you can buy 
so that you can get into some of these businesses and, and basically buy access. So there's one group doing this research approach. There's another that is then staging that attack. And then you've got the third aspect, which is the exfiltrating that data in whatever m means that that may be. Like in the beginning of ransomware, we started to see the encryption of data, but it always doesn't need to be that. It doesn't need to be that cutthroat either. Like some people just want to get in and cause havoc. Think about business that that is a public service that they want to cause havoc in a public service between a city within the world or something, maybe it's political. There's a lot of different gains that they can make by creating those that that that, that havoc around that. So I went into a little bit of a um, whirlwind there, Sam, but I'll let you get back on back on track into the five five things. <laughs> No, you bring up some really good points there as well, especially around like the, the exfiltration component. We're absolutely going to cover that. And Lily asks us uh, a good question, which teases up for these like five keys to unlocking success with secure backup, which and, and Lily's question is what emerging technologies or trends do you see shaping the future of secure cloud backup and recovery? So, you know, let's just let's just cut to the chase and get into it. And this isn't necessarily an emerging trend or technology. It's actually a bit of an age-old age adage that was invented by a photographer, which is the three, two, one rule, right? So whether your data is hosted on premises or in the public cloud, the three, two, one rule is, is always going to be applicable and timeless. And essentially it breaks down as this, three copies of your data, right? So you've got one production and then two copies, um, ideally backups, and those are stored on two different types of media. Now, when we're talking about you know, backups of on-premises that we might be hosting on-premises or send into the cloud, that two different types of media is, is often like kind of disk and maybe we're sending a copy to object storage on the public cloud. Maybe we're even doing tape, right? Tape is one of the most like immutable storage types out there and one of the um, kind of best ways that we can, we can prevent against that, the, the, the ransomware at least, sorry, not prevent, but at least recover because tape, you know, once we've written our backup to it, we eject the tape, we sometimes send it off to Iron Mountain, um, but there's that physical air gap there. Um, but in the public cloud, when we're backing up our data, what are the different types of media that we can utilize there? Now, the first line of, um, of data protection in the public cloud is the native snapshot, right? So if we're dealing with like an Amazon EC2 instance, we'll often take a snapshot of that stored on an EBS volume and call it a day. But that's only two copies of your data, right? Your production data and the snapshot, but it's all stored on, on, on an EBS volume. We've then got to be able to take a image-based backup of that machine and store it on that different type of media. Again, that's typically object storage. So Amazon S3 in Azure, we're dealing with Azure Bot Blob. We've got object storage on Google Cloud Storage as well. But those are your two different types of media. And then we get onto the piece of one copy of that being off-site. And how do we do that in the public cloud? Now, within the same region, you might send it to a different availability zone. You might even send it to a completely different region, right? We've got folks that are you know, running their production environment on US East 1. They take their snapshot, the snapshot stored in US East 1. But then they're sending a backup copy maybe over to US West 1 um, in order to, to have that actual physical geographical separation off-site. We've also got users that are actually then sending a backup copy either on-premises to uh, you know storage that is on-premises or to another cloud. So if anything goes wrong with that public cloud infrastructure, they have a completely different platform to recover to. So three, two, one rule is, is always going to be applicable, is always going to be critical. Michael, anything that you want to add around this? Yeah, I think this is a baseline, right? Like you mentioned, this this comes from a photographer. If you imagine what a photographer is is capturing out there on his shoots or their their shoots, um, it's obviously important data. So they're making sure um, that they've got a copy either in their bag and then they're sending one up into the cloud or to a different location. That's exactly the same as what we'd encourage as a baseline. However, we've got like you've got to ask yourself how bad is bad because where Sam mentions that one off site and it being a different availability zone, maybe let's, I'm going to use AWS. I don't mean it in any, any way to offend AWS or anyone using it, but maybe we're all in on AWS. We don't have any other cloud workloads anywhere else. And I'm going to make my one off site into a different availability zone, which 
okay, fair enough. That is a different data center. It's a different physical location on the AWS cloud platform. However, what happens if, how bad is it if we were to lose access to anything AWS? At that point, do we want to have another copy offsite or should we already have that copy offsite into either an on-premises location or somewhere else? So I think you've got to ask yourself at this point is this is a baseline as a bare minimum. And then you've got to look at, that, uh, at how bad is bad. But then equally, you've got to also look at your existing methods because the amount of times that I see that snapshots, an EBS snapshot is just being used to protect an EC2 instance, which is like, so if you combine snapshots plus backups, I'm okay with that. It means we have a durable way of being able to recover our workloads either fast from a, from a snapshot, but equally we have an offsite copy or a, a copy in our S3 bucket or somewhere else to be able to get back to. That, that snapshot though, as a standalone, which I see a lot out there in the field, that snapshot is not enough on its own. It doesn't meet that three, two, one. We have to consider another copy of that. So as you can probably tell, I'm pretty pas passionate about this as a baseline. This is a methodology. This doesn't have to be anything to do with Veeam software. I know I work for Veeam, but this, sh I, I, if you're using open source tooling, then at least follow this methodology from that, that perspective. Absolutely. And the next best practice kind of gets into around logically air gapping backups, right? That we, we touched a little bit on the air gap when I was talking about tape, right? We have that physical space, something that's not permanently connected to the network. So even if a, a, a bad actor gets in, starts causing havoc, if we have that logical air gap on a tape that's not connected to a network, they cannot gain access to it and we can pretty much guarantee the cleanliness of that tape. Now, how do you do that in the public cloud, right? We're dealing with resources that are constantly connected to the, to the internet, right? We, how, how do we achieve a, a physical air gap like we can do with tape in something that's just, not, that's just not feasible in the public cloud? Well, it comes down to a logical air gap, right? So this is um, looking at what are deemed as security boundaries on public cloud resources. So AWS, they talk about accounts, Azure subscriptions, Google Cloud, we're talking about projects. All of these public cloud providers have their well-architected frameworks, and there's a lot in there around security that you should be following, but just understanding how you can achieve that logical air gap, that actual separation um, of environments is, is absolutely critical. And the same goes for backup, right? So Michael's talking about um, taking a snapshot and then storing a backup in a different region, but we've got to ensure that air gap as well. So in this next example, I'm kind of just, again, just showing AWS, um, but they deem, again, the accounts as the um, security boundaries within their platform. So we always advocate for having a dedicated account just for backup and recovery. That's where your appliance or whatever backup solution that is that you're choosing is living. That's also where your repository lives as well, right? Likely your S3 buckets, not having that in the same account as the production workloads and making sure that you have that, that logical separation. So snapshots taken, stored in the production account, like Michael says, we have that quick recovery um, capability there, but then we have that copy, that, that durable, image-based backup is stored in a completely separate account or in Azure, it's a subscription. In Google Cloud, it's a project to again ensure that logical air gap. But it's not just enough to do that. We need to ensure that we are kind of uh, locking down access to that account. And that kind of comes down to the principle of least privilege. Michael, do you want to walk us through principle of least privilege, kind of what it means here? Yeah, and I think to go back to the the last slide right where sam says about having two accounts and two different environments and 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 across potentially two different availability zones again we're picking on aws for no for no reason other than to to show the concept but it's easier as as it's always like if you think about years gone by we all we've built our environment on premises we create an Active Directory environment for authentication, and we need to allow someone in. We create a new user. Maybe it's an IT user. 
we give them domain admin rights. Everyone's done it. Everyone's given everyone God mode. And before long, everyone has access to everything. Someone leaves, you're now up to 5,000 employees. How do you keep track of any of that? So you have to start at the very foundation of this for the next slide around how do we make sure that we don't set that same precedent in this new cloud environment where it's not just potential uh, insider threats, malicious activity from existing users. We're now talking about like when you're exposing anything to the internet, the whole world has access potentially. So we have to make sure that the least privilege model is taken in that only what you're allowed to see and do is available to your particular user. There, is, there shouldn't be. But again, it's very easy to, as again, I'll pick on well, any access management across the cloud. It's very easy to enable everything. You're allowed everything, you can do everything. But at that point, you're opening yourself up as a business that if anyone gains access to that environment, then you have a, you you potentially have that problem. So, adding things like multi, not only making sure that the roles and responsibilities are defined from an access management point of view, adding on additional security around multi-factor authentication, but also making sure that you might only have one-time access or um, permissions that only allow you to do certain privileged tasks around things like data protection security scanning, and then that's a cross account and, and all of that good stuff in there as well. But we have to think about this at the foundation. There's no point letting one team within your business go and build everything the easy way and quick way when this is such an important part. And a lot of the companies that are getting hit by ransomware or cyber threats are absolutely seeing that it's because they haven't closed the front door they haven't they've left the front door open basically to for for attackers to get in absolutely and we've got another good question in the in the chat coming from monica uh, and monica asks how often are we recommending taking these backups right uh, monica's producing critical data 24 7 without too much downtime um you know it's not a one-size-fits-all approach monica it's it's really you got to look at the criticality of that data and then what's your tolerance for data loss and or downtime right so we're starting to talk about service level objectives we're talking about recovery point objectives recovery time objectives and aligning those to um, the criticality of that data and this is this is critical not only from a security perspective but also from a cost perspective in the public cloud in fact uh, it is Flexera's state of the cloud report this year shows that cost has actually trumped security in terms of cloud challenges um, for the first time that they've been since they've been doing this report. Um, so we've got to think about how often we're taking these backups also from a cost perspective and making sure that we understand the criticality of that data. What's our service level objective for that? What's our tolerance for downtime? What's our tolerance for data loss? And then making sure that we're taking those snapshots and those backups in line with how critical that workload is. Um, again, from a data loss, downtime, security perspective, but also from a cost one. Because if we just take a snapshot, um, I don't know, every 15 minutes for each and every single workload, our cloud bill is going to get pretty big pretty quickly. Um, we want to be able to match kind of our policies and our service level objectives to the criticality of that data, um, again, from a security perspective, but also from a cost one. The next um, best practice that we always advocate for are utilizing immutability and encryption technologies, right? So immutability is exactly what it says. It's putting that data in a write once, read many state. So once that backup has been committed to object storage in this case, it cannot be changed, it cannot be deleted, it cannot be encrypted. And that is how we ensure that durability, the reliability, the integrity of the data within that backup. So even if we have someone that has managed to gain access into our environment, even if they have managed to cross those security boundaries and get into that backup account, and they can see the backups that reside in the object storage, if they're placed in that immutable state, then they cannot be deleted, they cannot be encrypted, and you can then utilize that backup to recover from. But there's another important piece to this, which is around encryption, and it comes back to what Michael was saying earlier on in the webinar around exfiltration, right? These, these bad actors, they're constantly evolving their uh, practices as we constantly evolve our remediative attempts, right? So first off, they were trying to get into the account and destroy the production data, but 
Then they realized they weren't getting paid their ransom because people were covering from backups. Then they started to attack the backups, but people started utilizing these best practices, placing in an immutable state, and they weren't getting their ransom because, again, the organization was able to recover from a clean backup. So then the next step is exfiltration, right? We're going to take this sensitive data that might contain personally identifiable information. It might contain health information, any sort of sensitive data. And we're going to leak that out on Reddit or on the dark web if you don't pay this ransom. And that's why encryption is so critical as well. So even if they do gain access to the backup and they can't change it, but then they can't exfiltrate it either and seek to extort a ransom from you, ransom from you that way. Um, so there's a number of different services to achieve immutability, S3 object lock, immutable storage for Azure Blob. And then from um, an encryption standpoint, you know, Veeam has its own AES 256-bit encryption, but there's a number of cloud services out there as well, like AWS KMS or Azure Key Vault, that really help um, streamline the task of encryption, the management of keys, even at scale. Michael, anything that you want to add here? Yeah, I think there's a so one. Yeah, the immutability is a is a de facto like that gives us a lot more protection. Not just again, in, in fact, both immutability and encryption both give us protection. Not only against these cyber threats that that we've obviously been discussing, but think about malicious activity within your business as well. Like if you, which happens, uh, we talk about it, but it happens out there in the field as well. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't. Um, disregard that so the immutability factor is even if you're a backup admin and you become a disgruntled employee for whatever reason and you think i'm going to delete all of these backups obviously if you're not using immutability then you could absolutely do that um so that's why we uh, evangelize advocate for people to use that immutability function within the public cloud to store those backups the 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 save the safety net here is that there is absolutely no one, not even AWS or Azure, can tamper with those those buckets of data, even if even if you've if sorry if you've set that immutability flag on there, which obviously protects you massively against any insider or cybersecurity threat as well. And then to the point around the KMS, the key management services, is the mentioned ones here: AWS KMS or Azure Key Vault, but equally something like a HashiCorp Vault as well, like a, a multi-cloud type offering around KMS is, a, is another option when it comes to being able to use a, a, a way of being able to define what that key management system looks like out external to the actual cloud. Another fail safe there is that if someone exposes your AWS account or your Azure account and you have set God mode, everyone's got access control um, and people can do any, anything they want, someone gains access, well, guess what? They can go in and they can delete that KMS system. Whereas if you've got it in another external system, such as HashiCorp Vault, then you've got the ability to um, maybe that's been that's another line of defense as well. But I would say these are in order of importance. I would say the, the principle of least privilege and the access rights. Let's get that right first so that we can that we can then start leveraging some of this this um, other technology later on as well. Absolutely. And that kind of brings us on to our last best practice that we always recommend, which is around testing and recoverability. Um, so from a testing aspect, always recommend to routinely scan your backups to ensure the integrity and recoverability of that backup. Right. It, Michael was mentioning that it, what was it, 49 days from when someone gains access to account to actually when the attack happens in those 49 days, you're taking backups and that ransomware is just going to be infecting that backup as well. And then when you go to recover from that, you're just reintroducing the infection into your environment. So making sure that you routinely check those backups to make sure that they are clean, they are free from ransomware, malware, whatever it might be, is critical to make sure that you're not reintroducing that infection into your environment. But then that also comes down to testing, right? Actually going through real world testing scenarios, proving that you can actually recover the data. And this is important, not only from a proving you can recover the data standpoint, but also from building that muscle memory, right? You, the, the last thing that you want is to be going through a real world recovery scenario and having that be the first time you're performing a recovery, right? The adrenaline's pumping, mistakes are happening, people are shouting, people are worried, 
you just want to be able to have something that you've rehearsed, you practice, you've known that you can do. Um, so making sure that you test is, is critical. And then the final piece around recoverability is being able to recover to an alternate environment is, is, is very, very important as well, right? If, um, and it might not just be ransomware, right? It could be any sort of like outage or um, data, data loss scenario. Um, recovering within that same environment might be feasible, but being able to recover to another environment just gives you another out, right? Another option to get back and get your business up and running. So that might be within the same uh, within the same environment, right? You might be going to a different account or region, but it's still the same platform. But that might be also recovering from cloud to on-premises. It might be going from one cloud to another, right? AWS to Azure, Azure to AWS. We see a number of Veeam users um, doing this. Or anything around testing recoverability to it. Yeah, I think this is always the 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 worst bit about disaster recovery or business continuity, right? When it comes to data, because it's hard. Because who makes the decision to bring down the business to make this test? And I think the most important thing to consider here is well, you don't always have to do that either. But I want to know as an IT team, a security team, as a as a business, I want to make sure that Whatever that failure scenario is, if it is cybersecurity, great. That's obviously what we're talking about here today. But if it's an, an act like a flood, an act, yeah, an act of God type type scenario, a flood, fire, whatever that may be, I want to make sure that I can bring that data up. And I'm as an IT admin or as a CTO of a business, I want to make sure that I can bring that up in a different location, maybe multiple locations to ensure that I can keep the business running. Like Sam said, I don't want to be doing this on the day that something bad happens. I want to know what, a, I, as a business, I want to define what a disaster, what bad looks like. I mentioned that a few times. And then I want to take that bad scenario and I want to practice because we'll, if you practice for what that, that bad scenario looks like, then you're going to have a way out. You're going to be, you're going to be trained. You're going to be more aware. You're going to be calmer. You're going to have things documented and you can even then go to the next level around automated recoverability using things like mobility of that data, portability of that, making sure that we can directly restore into the public cloud or into a different, um, different public cloud if need be. Um, and have that, run book as such in an automated fashion like this doesn't have to be like it was 15 years ago where we have to bring everything down and everyone's got to come in for the weekend we've moved well past that dr tests are there so that we can actually make sure that our our, our systems are back up and running and um, because bad things happen right cool Absolutely. All right. So why don't we uh, get on to, to maybe one demo, Michael, um, your choice on, on what to show, but just to kind of see some of this in action. Yeah. So so the, the premise of, and I had two demos lined up, but I, I appreciate time time is uh, is running out. So the first demo, I have a, a, an Amazon RDS, but the concept of the two videos, the two demos that I'm going to touch on is that it's a database that has been exposed or is exposed to the internet. Now this database in particular is running on RDS and that's what I'm gonna show. Um, but the other one that maybe we get to, maybe we don't, but imagine this, a database that is running in Kubernetes or anywhere else is just as, a, a, it's a, just a threat. It's, a, it's another database and we can do exactly the same thing to it. So, right, I'm gonna try and push this video to the audience. Okay, so here we have MySQL Workbench. For those not familiar, this is just a graphical interface looking into our very, very simple database. And you can see here, we've got a, a list of our names, our companies that are associated. These just happen to be um, analysts that I get to speak to on a, on a weekly basis. So you can see here, I've done that, I've showed you. Now I've ran an encryption of that. That's what encryption looks like especially if you don't do it, it's bad. If you don't encrypt it, it's bad. Um, one of the sayings that a colleague of mine, Rick Vanover, would say is that um, if you don't encrypt your data, someone else will. So obviously at this point, we've got a failure scenario. We jump into Veeam at this point. I want to recover that RDS instance. 
but you can see hopefully in the background on the top left you can see other other scenarios you can see mysql there you can see virtual machines they all could be running that same database but in this particular instance mistakes were made and we've encrypted our someone has encrypted our data and gained access to that so obviously before we go back and restore any data we're going to we're going to close the door we're going to lock things up we're going to make sure the access control is fixed so that the the threat is still not um in place and then simply put we're going to hit that restore button and if we go back into our aws console or into our sorry into our veeam backup for aws console you'll see that we've got an rds backup job that is sending our backups into um sorry a snapshot of that rds um instance and now we're restoring that and you can see this is running here and now I'll go back into the RDS management console refresh that you can start to see that we're bringing that snap back into our into our RDS so obviously the joys of uh video demos means I can speed things up a little so you can see that that's finished we now go into our we can see that from Veeam backup for AWS everything is complete we can see that our database is now back up and running and if we go back into mysql workbench and we run that same show databases and we go and select all of the the names you can see that we're back up and running the important point that i wanted to make here was that the a database running in rds or a database running in um cloud sql within google or azure sql or a, a database running in a virtual machine or a database running in kubernetes it's the same day it's a database the, if someone gains access to that they have the ability to do what you just saw there encrypt that data and then at that point that data is compromised you can't use it now i i you, i hit the easy button and i encrypted everything in one fell swoop now what i would do if i was a bad guy if i was on the red team against the blue team i would absolutely just go through and randomize what my encryption looked like i wouldn't consider encrypting everything then how do we get back up and running from that? That sounds like a, a more challenging scenario as well. But obviously, from a backup perspective, we've got our last line of defense in an encrypted manner, in a, in a mutable, in an immutable uh, object storage location, allowing us to bring that that data back without any further um, hiccups in there. Okay. Was there any questions right. that came? So that kind of brings us to a pretty much to time we've got one more question coming in um so do you have any practical tips or recommendations for businesses who are just starting to improve their cloud backup and recovery strategy um i mean hopefully we covered that for you um in this session today megan again make sure that you have three copies of your data two different types of media one off-site um, whether that is on premises or in the cloud always make sure you follow that three two one rule if you're running in the public cloud making sure that you understand what the security boundaries are and that you're backing up across those security boundaries to achieve that logical air gap, absolutely critical, but that's not enough, right? You've got to leverage the principle of least privilege, making sure you're using things like IAM roles to lock down that access, making sure that, you know, that the application, the user um, only has the minimum amount of privileges required to perform their role or their job and no more. Um, but also make sure that you rotate those credentials quite frequently as well. And then you delete any credentials that are no longer required um, is, is critical. Also, um, some other you know, least privileged stuff, multi-factor authentication, very, very good um, for brute force attacks as well as man in the middle attacks. And then utilizing role-based access control as well is, is a good piece. That brings us to um, immutability encryption. Make sure that you place those backups in an immutable state. So once they are committed to that storage, they cannot be changed, encrypted, or deleted. And speaking of encryption, making sure that you are encrypting your data um, yourself to prevent against exfiltration, right? Like Michael was saying, if you're not going to encrypt it, someone else is. So making sure that you use encryption. And then finally, test your recoverability, right? Make sure that you build that muscle memory, but also prove that you can do a restore from those backups. Um, so if you ever are faced with a recovery scenario, the first time you're facing it, yeah, in, in a real world situation, is, is not the first time you're actually um, performing it. So that brings us right to time. I just wanna say thank you to everyone for joining um, today. Hope we answered your questions. Hopefully we've given you some good practical advice that you can go out and implement, whether you're using Veeam or not. 
if you guys do want to get hands on with the product um, that, that we offer that can achieve all of this and more, we've got a number of freemium editions that are available on things like the AWS marketplace, the Azure marketplace that you can go out and deploy and start protecting your data using these best practices for free, right? We allow you to protect up to 10 instances for free, no feature limitations, no limitations on recovery, no limitations on time, um, just protect up to 10 instances. So I wanna say thanks again, Michael, any parting words from you? Uh, my only thing is, um, what does bad look like? Um, we always want to look about what good looks like. That's uh, that's a human nature, right? We always look at the nice, shiny new things. Always take a, a second to look at what bad looks like because that's going to enable you to have a better backup and recovery strategy. You can add cloud on that if you want, but I would say just a backup and recovery strategy in general because people have got data all over the place. Absolutely. Well, thanks once again for joining and we'll see you on a webinar soon.